Hello, this is Digital Accessibility, the people behind the progress. I'm Joe Walensky, the creator and host of this series. And as an accessibility professional myself, I find it very interesting as to how others have found their way into this profession. So let's meet one of those people right now and hear about their journey. All right, well, here we are again with a, another episode where I have a great opportunity to talk to an accessibility practitioner. And today, I'm very pleased to be speaking with Rich Schwartfinger. Hello, Rich, how are you today? Good, you Joe, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm, as usual, uh, ensconced in my uh, Vashon Island office, which is near Blink's Seattle headquarters. Uh, where are you okay. located? I'm located um, near in Krylandike in Bonaire in the Southern Caribbean. Um, we retired here back in uh, uh, 2007, two here in 2017, and uh, we like scuba diving, so that's what we do all the time here. Yeah. Well, it's, it sounds like a fabulous place to be, and I, I mentioned uh, before that it's an area I want to visit, uh, so it's... Uh, uh, you know, great to be talking to you. And uh, you're retired now, but I, I definitely uh, was happy to be able to have this chat with you because uh, um, you've been involved in so much uh, within the accessibility profession and, and helping to uh, grow things for all of us. So, uh, you know, maybe a, a good place to start is kind of, uh, you know, what you've done most recently related to accessibility and maybe the kind of the final things that you were doing as your full-time uh, activity, and, and then we can go from there. Okay, well, um, as you said, I retired. I did that at the end of 2016, and we moved down here. Uh, I think some of the related to accessibility uh, that I've done is uh, I, uh, I, I chaired the board of nobility for about two years after I re continued to chair the Board of Nobility, two years after I retired from IBM. So when I was working at IBM, uh, I was the Chief Technology Officer for Accessibility at IBM when I retired. Um, I also chaired the board of this nonprofit, which does a lot to uh, educate people on how to make the web accessible and, and other things like that. Um, and we did a lot in the last few years in training executives and uh, also students going to college so, so that we would have people uh, who basically get ingrained accessibility in their, in their working careers. Um, so, when I, so I did that the last couple of years I was here. Um, I actually uh, had <laughs> in the middle of my retirement, we were in Rajampat, and uh, I, I had actually had a knee tendon rupture and I got to experience what it's like to get around the island when you have a disability. So I wrote an article for the local newspaper saying how bad things were. Um, but uh, so I did do that. And uh, you know, not accessibility related, but I actually uh, chaired the board of a nonprofit here that was looking to preserve the monuments on the island uh, from development. So I did some of those things. And you know, beyond that, like I said, I'm into scuba diving. So I do a lot of volunteer work. Um, I uh, we restored the sponges on the famous salt pier here in Bonaire. Uh, they were refurbishing the pier, and, the, and these sponges had come off. And we, and there, it's a big tourist attraction, so we put them all back on. Uh, cleanup dives. Uh, we had when the sargassum hit here, or an oil spill and spill hit here. I was involved with my wife and I were both involved with uh, doing the cleanup. So that's what we've done since um, retirement, and. Uh, you know, I've gone in, I've given interviews uh, on uh, how we did things back in the day with accessibility and how that affected things uh, going forward. So that's that's basically the extent of my accessibility work since since retirement. Well, it, it, but it's, it, it sounds like uh, retirement is kind of in quotes for you because it sounds like you've been really <laughs> keep yourself continually busy. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I also, I mean, I have a YouTube channel, so I do, I do underwater cinematography. That's my uh, big passion of mine too. Totally unrelated to what I did in the past, but uh, yeah. So but I, I, I think know. you said that your, uh, your last position uh, at IBM was ch uh, chief technology officer for accessibility. Uh, I imagine that uh, 
can, that's a considerable amount of uh, activities and responsibility there. Uh, maybe before we go, kind of delving into the past, uh, you know, what were you uh, involved with as the CTO of access accessibility? Well, okay, so let me just backtrack a little bit. So I'm, I'm actually the very first distinguished engineer at IBM uh, on, on accessibility. There had never been one before. So, um, and, and, then, and I think that speaks a lot about what we were able to achieve as a group at, at IBM and that I, yes, I led things, but big things are never done by one person. Uh, and I'm, I think I was then also the first chief technology officer for accessibility at the company. So uh, I don't know if they have one right now, but uh, I think a lot of that, I mean, I could go into my career things, but one of the big things um, was the ARIA work. And we can talk about that a little bit later if we, uh, that, because that also, you know, some of the big things that you, that you achieve is when you tie accessibility to a business case at the company. And that's part of what you really need to do as like an accessibility officer is you, if you're going to move, you basically as a, just as a CTO or a distinguished engineer at IBM, that's kind of like the chiefs of the boat, you know, like on a, on a, on a submarine. These are the guys that, that are usually the, la the buck stops here. Uh, when somebody is in hot water, maybe because they didn't produce something that's accessible, they call you in and to clean up the mess. Or if there's something uh, affecting the business uh, on a big way, I mean, uh, the work that I did on our I actually started out with a, we had a $20 billion software business that was at risk. And I could talk about that if we have time. Uh, that ARIA's actually helped not only just help people with disabilities, but also opened up the broader open web and, and IBM software middleware business. So, um, so all of that, I think, contributed to uh, my getting that, that position at the company. And so, um, but yes, it's a lot of experience. I mean, uh, a lot of uh, responsibility with that job. You really are responsible for your part of a, this $20 billion software business at the company at the time. And so that included, you have to build infrastructure you, for to support your products. You have to um, uh, get tools to support it, assistive technology support. You had to uh, sell the rest of the world on the, te on the technology that you were you know, you can't just invent stuff. If you can't get other people to use it, it's usually a failure. So uh, I'm not the type of guy who would go out and just, okay, I'm going to go, here's how you, here's, here's all the directions for making your product accessible. Yeah, I, I contribute to that, but the whole infrastructure to even make that possible is what I was involved with. So. Well, I, I definitely want to dig uh, more into your ARIA work, but uh, I, one of the things I like to do uh, in this series is find out how people made their way to where they are today, because uh, for each of us, it tends to be a, a, a winding, circuitous path to where we end up. Uh, so uh, kind of what what would be a milestone well, for you? What, what were the first glimmers of okay, that so path? So that's a great way. It's a, it's this winding path. It's, it's a really good way to describe it. So um, I'll, I'm going to take you back to, I want to say 1990. All right. This is about right before I, I started at IBM. So uh, I was working in the oil field business and nothing to do with accessibility. And I had developed the technology that basically recovered all their North Sea drilling operations, which was the signal process simulator. Actually, nothing to do with accessibility. And uh, anyways, the, the company was restructuring. The oil, the oil business had kind of tanked a bit. And uh, you know, what I was doing was the next generation decoding system, and it was around OS2. So Jim Thatcher, uh, you may or may not know Jim Thatcher. Uh, so Jim was looking for someone who was an OS2 internals expert, OK? And uh, uh, so I, I was looking for a job, uh, and uh, this thing came up at the IBM's Watson Research Lab, and I said, I don't know what a screen reader is, but this was kind of interesting. I always wanted to work for IBM when I was younger, and I said, well, let's go give this a try. So uh, anyways, they accepted my resume, and uh, so I, I, I still remember my first day at IBM seeing Jim Thatcher. I mean, this is, you know, he's not with us anymore, but I remember, for, he was a, a lot older than me. I think I was, uh, 
know, back in night, this was back in 19, 1990. So it's a number of years ago. And so I come in, I'm waiting in the, in the lobby and this guy comes running down this, I mean, literally running down the stairs with a big grin. It's like, he just, he just won the lottery. Somebody's going to solve this technical problem he had. And what had happened at that time in 1990 is the, the world was moving from, from DOS, which is a character-based system, to Windows and OS2. OS so this graphical user interface. And it was completely inaccessible. And uh, so uh, people were concerned about losing access to the computer. I mean, completely. You would not be able to go to school anymore. Uh, it's a little bit like how Aria started too, uh, because we were gonna, everything was going to the rich web and we we're gonna lose access to the computer. So my job at that time was to figure out how we could capture what was drawn on the screen in real time and make it um, accessible to a screen reader. So that meant I needed to capture text when icons were drawn at a very low level. And so um, I, I kind of leveraged my uh, work in uh, operating systems because uh, uh, and real-time systems. I used to work, my first job out of school was the F-15 weapons system, which is a, a real-time system. So all of this stuff came in, plus my OS2 internal work, which was kind of rare. Uh, uh, to, to have people that would have those skills. And it all kind of, you know, it just, like you said, you just kind of get the right place at the right time. You had the right set of skills. And, um, and so I didn't realize, honestly, how important this was uh, until I started doing the work. And, and in, I think it was, it was the summer of 1991, an article came out in Byte Magazine. Now, back then, Byte Magazine, do you remember Byte Magazine, Joe? Or, yeah, it was like or, that uh, thick uh, at yeah. one point. <laughs> well, back then, um, the, an article by Joe Lazaro came out uh, talking about loss of the computer to the blind, and uh, which highlighted the problems I was just talking about. And I actually had managed to get some working with the team in the lab. So, uh, and I, I, you're reading this article, you could just, you could cut the fear with a knife. It was like nothing you've ever experienced before that you can potentially make a difference, uh, in. And so I, I, so I read this Byte article and I, so I contacted John Udell at, at Byte and I said, John, you know, we actually have a working prototype of this right now. This is before Windows even, we could we actually back then, we couldn't even get Microsoft to look at this back then. They, wouldn't, they weren't, weren't interested. So uh, we were doing this on OS2 to start. And uh, so I wrote this article that it's, it's, it's constantly referenced today. It's called Making the GUI Talk in December 91. So this, uh, this was big, this, this like a seminal article. And I was, I am, um, what really hit me is Jim, who the led the team, he, he went to Washington to discuss loss of access to the computer by the blind. And he went to this government building on the second floor and outside the room, there were tables lining the wall with stacks and stacks, of like uh, maybe a hundred copies of this Byte magazine art thing. And we, and to, to basically summarize it, everybody thought IBM had solved this problem and everything was going to be okay. That, I really can't tell you how that life transformational something like that is for someone. And to me, it was, it was big. So... Um, Anyways, long story short, I remember I went to my very first trip to CSUN that year, and I felt like I was Mick Jagger, <laughs> because everybody wanted to meet who's the guy who wrote this article. And, uh, and it's not about I did this or I did that. What mattered is um, we had actually made a difference. That, to me, was more important than anything else. And then uh, I was actually the first person, I took what I learned there, and I was the first person to hear Windows talk for the first time. I actually, uh, Jim challenged me to figure out how to, oh, you're never going to solve that. I hacked the Windows operating system. I know I'm running an OS2, the, the display driver, and we had it, and I got it working. 
uh, and I had undocumented calls we, we, uh, into the operating system to communicate between o, the OS2 screener and Windows. And, um, you know, it, it just uh, to make it fast, fast enough. And uh, so we would, I remember back in the day, we would go into, um, I would go to a customer site and they were having a problem. Everybody was running Windows, except for the one person who could not see the screen was running OS2 just because of our screen reader. And also it was the first one that was programmable and had a programmable interface, user interface. Um, we actually, I, uh, we actually, I know it was me, I think we were Jim, we basically gave our documentation to PAL, which is our program access language, to Chuck Operman, who was working at Henry, at Henry Joyce, and they used that as the basis for their scripting language back then. So, because uh, we weren't going to build a, a, a native Windows screen reader, so we figured, well, okay, let's let's give them let's get them started. So, anyways, that's how it started. Um, and uh, I guess after that, I mean, I've done a, n a number of other things. I've worked on Java accessibility. I don't know if you remember Java. Um, I work with Sun on the Java Accessibility API. We did the first talking screen reader for that. I did, uh, we did some magnification software. We did work for, for seniors uh, that, that got deployed in Tokyo because they have a, a, a huge aging population in Tokyo and, and with a lot of, you know, cognitive impairments and sight impairments and, you know, a whole range of things. And these kiosks were deployed all over downtown so that people could access information, which was kind of cool too. So, so we did a lot of that. And, um, and I think, so uh, that's kind of like in the middle before, I mean, Java was at the time it was big, but I would not call it transformational. But what I found in your career is even though you may not, use it directly may not be big what you learn from that is critical for the next step that you have to take and um so this gets into the whole thing with aria so yeah, well uh, yeah it's just if i jump in before that uh yeah i mean so you you were in involved in some really foundational aspects of uh and a modern uh modern soft software and digital expression uh uh that audibleized uh information and so you, you definitely were in a unique situation uh, you know a lot of people become familiar with accessibility because there's been building blocks there already but kind of when you came into it you were really at that uh kind of that origin stage of of bootstrapping and building it and so uh yeah i think that's uh Kind of puts you in a very unique position, and uh, but 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 to get to my question, uh, there must have been something in that first period uh, when you're working with it where you decided you wanted to continue in that that area. So maybe talk a little bit about that because uh, you could have obviously gone in a different direction. Uh, you'd done uh, different things before that. So what was it that kind of kept kept you on that track? Well. Okay, so one of the things you have to I mean, is understand there's different types of people, okay? And there are people that need to have something to start with, and there are people that can start with nothing and have to, and, and can make something happen. I, I'm kind of that type of a person. The other stuff doesn't float my boat that much. Um, and the fact that I could use that about me uh, to, well, I mean, one of the things I should tell you is like when we were doing the screener, we, IBM employed a lot of people with, who were disabled and you work with these people and they contribute to the design, your user experience. And when they're successful, you see it on a big, on a big scale, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I found that, and you know, working with Sun on job accessibility was also a, a great thing. You know, I, <laughs> here's an example. We, they had a job accessibility, I won't say this company, but um, we had somebody that had an accessibility API infrastructure out there that we had, they had, a, Sun had a meeting with, uh, with a whole bunch of industry leaders and they said, okay, um, we want to make this successful. And the other company 
um, uh, actually, we'll say it. it was Microsoft at that time. They said, well, just use our API. And I said, but I knew, you know, from how to, because under the covers to support uh, the screen reader, you had an API and what you needed, what they needed to get information. And so um, they didn't have what you needed. They didn't have all of it. Uh, and, um, and it also, it was very tied to what is we needed something to be cross-platform. So I remember this is the coolest thing. So, so we got in there and with Java, you could do things like 10 times faster than low level operating system stuff. And, and I remember, so this start, this was in like January or February of, uh, I forget what year it was, I wanna say 1987, something like that maybe, or 80, 80, uh, 1997 or 96, but we, anyways, long story short is we basically worked together as a team, we created an API and we got a working screen there all in a matter of, and I mean, it talked everything you can think of, it did it, right? It did it in about six months. I mean, six months is incredible, plus a reusable infrastructure. And we went to, what's, what's the conference they have uh, up in Closing the Gap? I think it is up in, oh, they still have that in, uh, uh, in Minnesota. That still, Minnesota. That still happens. Yeah, so we went there because that was the first available conference. And I remember, because I know Microsoft tried to implement their API on two buttons at, at CSUN, just two buttons. We had working list boxes, spreadsheets, I mean, everything, right? Rich text editing. And um, he came in, I remember his jaw dropped and hit the, <laughs> you know, at that time. So, uh, but the good thing is, you know, we all kind of, even even Mike, we all tend to work together. And, and, and I felt that was the most, that to me, being able to have the impact, I didn't really want to go back. I mean, going back to what I did before, it's it's just not the same. You can't you can't have an impact like that. I mean, it's very rare. So uh, anyway, that's why that's 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 why I stayed in. Oh, you that's know? good. That's that's great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's uh, you know a good part of the story to hear about. And and then uh, you know. Definitely, uh, you know, that next important part of, of your career was surrounding the, uh, uh, the area technology for people that aren't familiar with uh, that. Uh, the acronym I'm using is ARIA, which actually uh, was built on RIA, which was Rich Internet Applications, which going back 20 years ago, uh, as uh, there was the dot-com boom and websites uh, exploding, they they weren't really as robust uh, as uh, people were used to with uh, applications that they would have on their Windows as Mac operating systems. And so rich internet applications started to come up about. And then there was accessible rich internet applications, which is where you came into the picture. So talk about a little bit about the uh, evolution of that. Okay. so so. Right around, this is around 2003, 2000, you know, okay. Um, so I was working in research and the head of emerging technologies who I worked with on Java comes up, he, he comes and he reaches out to me and I, we had a good working relationship for, for other reasons aside of Java work. He comes into my office, doesn't tell me why, he says, hey, Rich, you know, I'd like you to come over and be the lead architect for accessibility in our software group, which is so lead research and then do whatever it is. So he never told me why. And I said, well, I, that sounds exciting. I get to do something, something different. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I went over there. And so I was working at Austin and we got a call that we were going to have a, a, a team meeting in Cambridge, Mass. And uh, so, for, so we, we all fly up there and we spend the morning and we're, we're talking about odds and ends. And after the meeting's over, he, he says, I need you to come with me. So we go, we go into this part of, I mean, this is really super secret stuff at the time. We go into this all the way into the back area of the floor in this like hidden cubicle, you know? And he brings up 
This is before Google Docs, okay? The very first uh, uh, working office suite running in a web browser. I mean, this is like, so, uh, so you have to understand why this would be so important from a strategic perspective for, for the company. So what you, if, you, if you look back at that time, you had, um, you know, Microsoft owned nine, over 90% of all the clients' apps in space. Uh, and what they had done is they also owned over 90% of the browser market. And what they had done uh, is they had moved their entire uh, Internet Explorer team out to Beijing, China, and they put it in maintenance mode. And uh, so the only thing they're willing to make changes to that browser was to uh, security fixes, uh, you know, things like that. But, you know, they had a lot of stuff with ActiveX back then that they had to deal with. Uh, that was another uh, programming model. And they were pushing. And so what they wanted to do is they wanted to use this market position to basically tie the client desktop to their middleware. Where you could only use their middleware, and so what they had done is they 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 had said, okay, we're going to basically make the web kind of obsolete because we're not going to do anything, and and so for IBM this was this for them was a killer for their software business because, um, you know, if if Microsoft if, we, if people aren't deploying to the web, that's a big issue uh, because. What we had, what they had come out with in the lab, uh, with the, this, this came with a company acquisition uh, from a company called Alpha Blocks. And uh, they, they, they told why they bought this company, but the real reason they bought the company was for this technology. And, um, and so um, if we, the, the problem was the, to be able to make this uh, consumable is, we had to get over two big accessibility law restrictions that were in WCAG 1. And, and the two words you had to run with JavaScript and CSS turned off because it wasn't accessible. And the reason that that was at that time was because people that worked on web accessibility didn't really know software accessibility from a holistic internals level. And having worked on Java uh, and having worked with, uh, I, I actually pr provided feedback on Microsoft Active Accessibility work. We used to go to those meetings and, and work with their team. Um, you know, they just didn't, they didn't have the skill set. So they looked at this as, I don't know how to fix this. So the first thing you do is you say, well, we can't fix it, so we're going to make it inaccessible. So it's basically, so and what happened is every major government organization throughout the planet basically said, you can't use these technologies and be accessible. So, you know, what this means is companies like Oracle, IBM, you know, all the big middleware companies, they couldn't deploy their, their software. So, um, and I and he said, you know, the problem is, and I said, yeah, you're using JavaScript and CSS to create these user interfaces and they're not accessible. Yeah. And this had been not been solved for six years. So, yeah. And um, the whole $20 billion software business is riding on it. We need you to figure it out. So no pressure, Joe. <laughs> so um, I went back to Austin and I started looking at um, how these apps were constructed, constructed. And they had a document object model, which is like a tree. And the reason they have that model is because it's modeled after the desktop window hierarchy, because that's how they propagate keyboard and mouse events. So to tie it into the operating system, they had to use the same infrastructure under the covers. Um, and uh, so if you, if you look about accessibility APIs on platforms, they're based on I'm, this object tells you what type of object it is and what its role is, what its states are. And when things change, you get notified. So if you go from check to not checked, um, a screen reader or some others, maybe a, a, another type of um, uh, voice recognition system, whatever, gets notified when something gets changed, and then they respond. So that's how these systems work. And on the web, what was happening is, so they would take these, these elements that they provided for an HTML that had no semantics that matched, 
what you would use in conventional desktop platforms like menus and list boxes and all the other stuff. And I thought, you know, and this only took me about a month because I, I just happened to be, like you said, you're in the right place at the right time. I had worked with all this stuff on Java. I'd worked on screen readers. I, I could see the whole thing in front of me like it was clear as a bell. And uh, so what I, and I said is, look, if we could add these semantics on top of the HTML web page and say, well, I know this is what you think it is, but it's really one of these. And this is what's being changed. It's here it changes. Here's one that care about all these things. And if we could do that, then rich web applications would behave excessively like desktop applications. So, um, and like many things, Joe, in order to uh, it, it, this, solving the technical, the basic technical problem is actually often the easiest part. The hard part is making everybody get them to adopt it. So this means browser manufacturers, assistive technology vendors, uh, and not just Windows. You need to get the Mac. You need iPhones. You get all you know over time. All of these things had to get Linux right. And so uh, we had to pull a team together. We had to put people in the web standards efforts to create new standards for what's called DHTML accessibility early on. Uh, and we had to change Wiki to remove the restrictions, but you couldn't do it without something that proved that it worked. This is a, I mean, this literally took eight years to make all this happen. So then you have to change government policy. You know, so these are all the things, and I didn't do this all myself. I, I led a team that, that, that would do this, and, you know, and they're not always direct reports to me. And anyways, uh, we had to get that done, and we also had to get um, IBM's own product teams to support it. And then we had to actually extend the APIs on the operating system. So one of the fallouts is, is we went Microsoft's UI automation at the time was too slow, and so what we we, we, we under the covers, you have to map to each operating system platform. So we wrote an extension for uh, active accessibility and it's used today in Google Chrome. It's used in Firefox. It's used, you know, it's used in uh, open office. So, uh, so not only was that used, but also the infrastructure was used. So, and we also influenced uh, the other platforms. And, but more importantly, we got the other platforms like Apple, to join in and provide uh, their side of the point, how they worked and how we pulled it all together. But anyways, and, and I actually didn't come up with the name Aria. I think that was Judy Brewer that came up with that name. So uh, it was, it's, it's a uh, it kind of stuck. So Judy, you know, Judy. So, uh, so that gives you some idea of how I got to where I, I, I am. So I did. Yeah. And, 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 but, uh, you know, going to your point of, uh, you know, making sure that, you know, everyone is is willing to buy into, uh, you know, an invented solution. You did a lot of work with uh, World Wide Web Consortium and Working Group, and, and uh, W3C is all about collaboration across all kinds of different levels, uh, government, academic, uh, corporate, different international uh, aspects to it. So uh, that was a big part of your work as well, wasn't it? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a really... That that's, that's important points that you've, you've observed because um, I remember having these discussions at IBM and I said, you know, your first, you know, because I was also on the patent board too at the time. I said, your first blush is we need to patent this. And I said, that's the last thing you need to do. You need to be able to make this freely available to everybody or else they'll, they'll run. They won't, they won't do it. They don't want to be locked in. So, we did, everything was open. We would open standards for w, through W3C. We did, we did uh, an, uh, an open accessibility API for iAccessible2. I mean, everything was basically free. And not only that, but if you could imagine these companies wanted to solve this problem too, and they all got, including Microsoft. Microsoft got in and they were a, a really a huge contributor to ARIA as well. So, you know, it's a, uh, we, we had a good, really good uh, experience with all of it. And if we had not done that, then that would probably, then, then we would be have a different world today, I think, if we, if we hadn't. But, um, but as a result of that, 
um, I can tell you that um, the proprietary platform of uh, Silverlight and, and their lock-in, all that stuff, you don't hear about it anymore. You hear about the open web, and but uh, you know, so we we it it, but everybody benefited. I remember I remember that uh, we had gained enough momentum that we would go to CSUN. We basically populate teams all throughout the whole conference. We work with Mozilla and whatnot, saying about showing people what we were doing. And I remember uh, Cynthia Shelley coming up to me and asking me, well, how do, how do we get involved? Because they were asking why Microsoft at that time wasn't involved with it. And I said, Cynthia, it's all open. You just joined the W3C. Anybody can, you, anybody can use it. There's no restrictions. I'll work with your team. So I think that what I, so this is interesting. So I remember so Cindy went back and she got the uh, Microsoft, because every time you join a, a W3C working group, you have to get approval by your legal team because it's, you know, so there's intellectual property involved and all that stuff. So in the meantime, what I started doing is I started having meetings every Monday night with Linda Mao uh, from the Microsoft team uh, working on Internet Explorer and sharing what we did, getting input, bringing it back to the group while they, so I was doing this on the back channel. And the, the pivotal meeting for me was, because uh, we told you they had moved the whole browser team out to, out to uh, Beijing, China. She said to me, we usually had these calls at nine o'clock at night, and, and uh, Linda was say, said to me on the call, says, well, I'm not going to be able to work with you anymore. I said, really? And I said, why is that? I said, well, we're moving the whole effort back to Red. And, and I said, is it because of accessibility? And she said, yes. So people don't realize this, but accessibility is the thing that basically b broke open the web because... At that point, the biggest player was still Microsoft. They had most of the market and they got involved with this. And the fact that they got involved and started working on it, uh, whether they were at the same level or not, you know, it may have taken a while, but it's, it's irrelevant. I mean, it, they got involved and it also gave credits for when Google came out with Chrome, the Chrome they, you know, this enabled their browser to take off and Firefox. And I remember Firefox, um, Plus, of performance reasons, it started shooting up in, in market share. Uh, Chrome took off later on. So that was the pivotal moment that people just don't know about. It was, it was so you ask why you do this stuff. How often do you get a chance to make that much of a difference? You, you really, and yeah, it's for people with, and for me, yeah, okay, so yes, I did this for business reasons. But for me, I always did it for the people with disabilities because I always, to me, that, meant a lot. When you see somebody, I mean, I, I remember when um, Tom Watkowski, he, um, he used to be a director for accessibility at AOL, and he went to remember the, the company name, this is getting older now, um, here, one of the big television companies, or what are broadcasting companies out of uh, uh, in Pennsylvania. And uh, so he, uh, I sent him, uh, Greg, uh, Aaron Leventhal, who worked on my team, he sent him a code example, a first terping, uh, talking tree widget on, on a web page. And so Tom was blind and he, cr he literally cried. Now, when do you do that? I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it, it's, 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 it's incredible. So I'm really proud of the work that everybody did and Yes, I'd let a lot of stuff, and I'm, I, don't, I don't make it sound like I did it all because I did, because a lot of people were involved with it. You know, I mean, Andy Snow Weaver and Becky Gibson were working on WCAG, changing WCAG. Aaron basically wrote all the code in Firefox that, that basically got it working, prototype in, in Firefox. Uh, um, we uh, Then he shared this stuff with the Mozilla team for Chrome, and, and on and on and on. There, there's just a lot of and great feedback from Microsoft, great feedback from Apple. Uh, and you, know, you also get your fights too with any standards efforts. You, you, get, you have your technical battles, but you know, overall uh, is, it was pretty cool. And I, so all of that got me, eventually got me to get that position at the company. So um, I'm, I'm very pleased with what everybody, what everybody did at the time, so yeah.
Well, that's, uh, I think, a great place to uh, end it with your uh, personal reflections on there. This has been a, a really uh, interesting uh, uh, and illuminating journey through some of these uh, foundational technical uh, building blocks to uh, the uh, accessible web that we have today. So I, I, I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, share your stories and uh, look forward to uh, maybe uh, joining you for a dive sometime. That'd be great. That would be great. The water is beautiful here. So yeah. All right. All right. Thanks you a lot, take Rick. care. All right. Thanks for having me. And uh, it's been an honor. Thank you. Bye-bye.